consider buying your processed oboe and bassoon cane from those friendly folks over at Barton Cane. Processed with care and precision for your everyday reed making needs. Take the pain and injury out of reed making by letting Barton Cane do the hard, repetitive, boring stuff. Free up time for practicing happy hours, hikes, baking, and spending time with friends and family. Barton Cane, here for you. Visit www.bartoncane.com. Specializing in the finest assortment of oboes, clarinets, bassoons, and their accessories, RDG Woodwinds serves musicians around the world. Their employees are all professional musicians who have a deep knowledge of the products that they sell. RDG's repair shop has an international reputation with a combined 100 plus years of service among the five repair technicians. Plain and simple, RDG provides excellent products and fabulous customer service. Visit them at rdgwoodwinds.com. They look forward to working with you. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. need to know <laughs> the background behind your background right now it's really too bad this isn't a visual medium <laughs> maybe we'll have to like post an image on our social media yeah i forgot uh i had a virtual background up until i opened up zoom to record for the podcast today and i was like oh god this is still here my question to you is can you tell what it is uh it is a screen grab (laughs) from the tlc show sister wives one of my faves listeners of the (laughs) podcast know that i'm obsessed with reality tv correct (laughs) And directly next to your head, okay, so we're in somebody's kitchen, but directly next to your head stands the first sister wife, (laughs) and she is peacefully gazing at her countertop. It's a... (laughs) It's a wet bar um, because when they, a long time storyline of the show was them all getting houses on a cul-de-sac and so they could live autonomously. They're a polygamous family. And so each wife could live autonomously, but they could have proximity to each other and like raise their kids together. And Mary has one child And so it was believed that perhaps she needed a smaller home. And it was very controversial that Mary got the largest home of all because she needed this uh, wet bar (laughs) to give her more counter space. Uh, Even though she's a religious fundamentalist, she's very sober, but she wanted this wet bar supposedly for the counter space. And in order to do that with the building floor plans, she has had to have extra bedrooms and and this and that. And she ended up getting the biggest house of all. So um... there's such a thing as dibs. I got to be on her side about this. There is such a thing as dibs. She got in first. She got in on the ground floor. She's the first wife. Thank you. Um, But so the reason people are like, okay, fine. Why is this your background on Zoom? <laughs> Because um, I listen to a Sister Wives podcast um, and it's, there's kind of a like little community of us who listen, who are fans of the podcast, and they had a watch party for one of the iconic episodes. And even though I'm very introverted and not a joiner at all, I surprised myself and joined in on the watch party. And so I was festive and had Mary's iconic wet bar uh as my background (laughs) is the wet bar as iconic in sister wives lore as the note is in jersey shore it's comparable it's definitely comparable okay um but it made me think like we should be doing this with double read dish listeners like we should have some sort of live event where like we watch something or play games or something because it was so much fun 
to just get together with people who had all the same inside jokes. Like we'd even have even have a read making party or just something. But I think like sometime this summer we need to have some sort of you know they had a costume contest and that's so, an idea <laughs> or at least a virtual background contest or something. That's an idea. Now my gears are turning. Well, and I was going to say this has nothing to do with double reads, and I'm sorry to the listeners, but I'm actually going to amend that statement because, wow, the 2023 IDRS conference is in Bangkok in just over a month. Mm -hmm. In a little over a year, the 2024 conference will be at the University of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff, Arizona, Mm -hmm. Which, if you know anything about the Sister Wives show, is where the Brown family moved when they left the cul-de-sac in Las Vegas. And many Browns, including Cody and Robin, still reside in Flagstaff. And so if any, if there is any crossover in the Venn diagram between Double Read Dish listeners and Sister Wife watchers, Please get in contact with me because I want to do some like, I don't know, sister wives fan outing while we're in Flagstaff. Like I want to go see Coyote Pass or (laughs) like, wait a minute, I have to jump in because she (laughs) pulled the friend card on me. She threatened me. Okay. Well, because you used to watch, you used to watch. I used to watch Sister Wives. I don't know why I stopped, but she said. I'm going to need you to watch the entire Sister Wives series. It's 17 before... seasons. <laughs> I'll give you my Peacock well, password, though. Of seasons. I must watch every single Sister Wives episode before IDRS 2024. Otherwise, she is revoking her friendship. Yeah, Double the podcast is, is going to end. Yeah. <laughs> You're on a, we're on a countdown. If you don't do this, this is an ultimatum I'm issuing. But yes, I'm not joking. If you're a Sister Wives fan and a Double Read player, hit me up. I want to come up with a Flagstaff Sister Wives outing. (laughs) 17 seasons of pure entertainment. Okay, so that's how I related that to double read content. Okay. So y'all can't mm-hmm. be mad that it's irrelevant <laughs> because I looped it in. And uh, yeah. Somebody's screaming, objection, your honor. <laughs> if at this point you don't know I will find any loophole to bring up reality TV, then you haven't Just been listening to the podcast. Stop listening right now. We I'm don't sorry. even want you to listen anymore. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it is what it is. I am who I am. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, and that's about what's been going on with me because I have not been practicing. <laughs> Good for you. I've been taking some time off. I'm about Good. to ship off my instrument for maintenance. I have not been practicing. When it comes back, I'll get back on track. But you know what? Time off is important and I've been taking it. So tell yeah. me what's been going on in your oboe life, Galit. Well, I'm excited because I have uh, an uh, oboe spa appointment later on in July. I cannot wait. This thing needs some help. Yeah, mine too. I don't think I've sent it off like after COVID. Yeah, it's been since the pandemic for me as well. Like it's been like looked at, but it hasn't had like an appointment. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Oh my God. This thing needs a lot of help. Yes. Anyway. The amount of judgment we're getting for this dish, I can only imagine. This is a highly controversial dish. I can hear people like, ugh, what's wrong with them? <laughs> Stop watching TV and go get your instrument service. Hello. Does that make us reality TV? Does that make us? <laughs> okay, it's getting too meta. Tell me about your performances. <laughs> uh, what's been going on with me lately? I actually played this um, concert last weekend that I wanted to talk to you about because we have the five senses. It had all of the senses covered. This thing was bananas wait the theme of the concert was the five senses no the theme of the concert was it was the closing concert of festival south like this month-long uh music concert series okay let me just describe the situation okay okay you walk into the convention center and you smell the uh what is it the smoke machines like smoking meat 
No, like like to make it smoky in there. Oh, fog machines? Fog machines, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Smoking meat. <laughs> I didn't know if it was like a carnival or a fair or something. I was like, okay, we're smoking meat. In Keep a going. convention center. <laughs> so the fog machines are going, even through the rehearsals. They have filled the room with fog. Did you take the opportunity to have some sort of like rock star moment and dramatically strut through the fog? I should have. That was a missed opportunity. A hundred percent. That's on me. The judgment just increased. But continue. <laughs> They have a full orchestra. They have a rock band in the middle of the orchestra. You know, like a drum set, a, a electric guitarist, a whole rhythm, a bass, like a whole rhythm section in the middle of the orchestra. Yes. Behind the orchestra, there is a full choir, which I could not even hear. I didn't even realize that they were there. <laughs> <laughs> then... Maybe there they were lost are... in the fog. <laughs> <laughs> there were lights, like not just spotlights, but colored lights on the sides, in the back, in the front. It was theater. Theater. There were dancers. There were backup singers. There were soloist singers. It was like a rock concert of rock tunes, like every guitar solo from the 80s and 90s, you know, like that kind of thing. There were circus performers, like (laughs) acrobats. There were aerialists, you know, like with the silks. Sounds like a Super Bowl halftime show. Behind us, there was a screen with a video. Oh my gosh. Song. It was the most bananas show I've ever been a part of plus everyone who came to to like all the audience members were given a glow stick so everyone was wearing glow stick necklaces they're like you didn't get tickets to the eras tour come the festival south correct (laughs) i was just like i don't even know what's happening like i was so proud of myself every time i counted arrest correctly because <laughs> it was like i'm sure stimulation overload yeah like... <laughs> you're like watching these circuits performing like the aerialists and the jugglers and <laughs> the people with the hula hoops and i was just like i don't even know what key i'm in right now i don't Honestly. know what piece i'm playing <laughs> <laughs> it's hard enough to focus when you're in like an opera pit to not like look up no. and see the action on stage let alone people Flying in front of your face on silks through the fog. It- mm-hmm. <laughs> you what it was. I mean, kudos to the organizers because I cannot imagine putting this concert together. It was like the most epic thing I've ever been a part of. That sounds wild. It was. It was. <laughs> and then they're like, now we're going to have an after party. I was like, I got to go home. <laughs> I got to decompress. I need to stare at a wall for a minute. Like driving home in silence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, are you going to the after party? No. No. I mean, my answer is always no, but. <laughs> Love should be multiplied, not divided. ACDC Reads is a one-woman bassoon read shop in Minnesota run by Ariel Detweiler, producing over 1,200 reads per year. Selling beginner and advanced level bassoon reads, ACDC Reads are hailed by customers for their even intonation, ease of response in all registers, warm tone quality, and strong low register. Every read is made from tube cane processed in-house to Ariel's specifications using Rigotti or Lavaro cane and a Rieger 1A shape. You'll also find bassoon-themed gifts in the shop, including greeting cards, stickers, artistic prints, and the ever-popular Blackwing Bassoon Pencil. Make sure to follow ACDC Reads on Instagram, where Ariel posts artistic photos and educational stories about her everyday experiences with readmaking. ACDC Reads is proud to sponsor Double Read Dish, sharing positive and uplifting interviews to inspire and connect the bassoon community around the world. Find ACDC Reads at acdcreads.com or at retailers like Chemical City Double Reads, Midwest Musical Imports, or Read Supplies Canada. 
Try out ACDC Reads today and let the read do the work. Chemical City Double Reads is a full-service double read shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Read Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at www.chemicalcityreads.com. We are so happy to welcome to Double Read Dish, Joshua Elmore, Principal Bassoon of the Fort Worth Symphony. Welcome, Joshua. Hi, thank you for having me. We love to start by asking our guests how they started playing their instrument. So can you tell us what brought you to the bassoon? Yeah, so when I was younger, I started out on piano around the age of 10 or 11. And I liked piano, but I was never really great at it. I think just the left hand doing one thing and the right hand doing another thing just didn't really work well with my brain and I couldn't really get very good at it. So fifth grade came around and my mother was a violinist in school. So I was, you know, gung ho on playing the violin. So I went in and tried all the different instruments, of course, but I already knew from the start that I wanted to play the violin. So, of course, we got the instrument slips and we decided what instrument we were going to play. And I put the violin on the sheet. Um, I then played the violin for fifth grade and quickly realized that that was also not for me. So (laughs) the beginning of sixth grade, I was walking through the music hallway in the upper elementary school, and I heard the band playing the Star Spickle Banner, and I was like, oh my goodness, this sounds incredible. Like, I want to be in the band. So after the band got finished rehearsing, I went to the band director, and I asked him, I said, is it okay if I, like, switch to clarinet? I feel like that would be a great instrument for me to learn how to play. And he, of course, gave me a band sign-up slip, and I went to my mom and I explained to her that I didn't think that violin was the right instrument for me. So I tried to convince her to allow me to play clarinet. And eventually she, you know, came around to the idea and I switched to the band program. And I played in the band on clarinet for a few months. And the band director announced to the band that there were a shortage of bassoon players. So he approached me. He's like, you, you know, you've taken to the clarinet very well. Uh, I was thinking of asking you if you would want to play the bassoon. And, you know, in sixth grade, I'm like, what is that? I've never heard of it, never seen it before. So he then points to the back of the band room, and there are two other bassoon players with the polypropylene plastic Fox <laughs> bassoons. And I remember looking at it and being in sixth grade, I'm like, oh, my goodness, this looks so cool. I can definitely stand out from everybody else. So I then went home with the slip that switching my instrument from clarinet to the bassoon. And my mom at this point, she's just kind of annoyed because I've already switched from violin to clarinet. And now I'm trying to switch from clarinet to the bassoon. And, you know, the band director had to do some convincing on my behalf as well. He's like, well, you know, if Josh plays the bassoon, he'll be able to get a lot of scholarship money to college because nobody plays the bassoon. And I think that was the point that sold my mother on me switching to the bassoon. And I switched the bassoon three months into my sixth grade gear, and I've loved it and been playing ever since. When you switched to the bassoon, was your mom like... I will only allow this if you're eventually the principal bassoonist of the Fort Worth Symphony. (laughs) At that point, I actually didn't even know that I wanted to do music professionally. I knew I loved it, but I didn't even know at that point that my life would be on this trajectory to be a professional musician. But I think what really sold her also was, I remember on YouTube at that time, the big hit on the bassoon YouTube world was the Super Mario Oberlin Bassoon Quartet video. And I remember I showed her that video and she was like, you know, it actually is a pretty instrument if you learn how to play it. But of course, at that point, I didn't really know anything. (laughs) So it didn't sound anything as good as that. But eventually I got to the point in which I could get around the instrument at a competent level. Yeah, that's kind of the perfect segue, um, because I'm curious about how did you begin to, you know, get serious and ultimately decide that music was what you wanted to pursue in college and professionally? Can you talk us through um, that gaining the intensity period? 
Yes. So I grew up in Cleveland, which is a great place to grow up if you want to do classical music, because the Cleveland Orchestra is, of course, one of the best orchestras in the world. So they're okay. Yeah. Yes, they're okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, throughout school, I grew up more specifically in Shaker Heights, Ohio, and the Cleveland Orchestra would often do run out concerts at the different schools around the Cleveland area. I remember every year they would come and do a uh, a concert at the Shaker Heights City School District. And I just remember just being enamored by the level of music making and just like the emotions that it would make me feel. And I think when you're growing up and at that young of an age, you're so impressionable. And I think just having that masterful musical performance happening on a routine basis every year really made me want to take music more seriously and see what I could do with it. And then eventually, you know, I would join extracurricular musical activities like the Cleveland Youth Wind Symphony, the Cleveland Orchestra Youth Orchestra. And that sort of also helped hone in my seriousness about the bassoon and music. And then when I was in high school, I partook my last year of high school, I partook in the Young Artist Program at the Cleveland Institute of Music. And that was really, I think, what launched me into my collegial career as a bassoon player was that getting that sort of serious look at what it would be like to study bassoon at a conservatory and then eventually going on to college after that and sort of having that be the routine I think getting that early one year prep was very helpful for me. What did that program entail? So I would do my normal uh, academic classes at Shaker Heights High School in the morning, and I would leave the high school around 1130, and I would catch the bus down from the high school to CIM, and I would study with all the undergraduate college students at CIM for the afternoon every day of the week. So It was basically like I was a part-time student at the high school, a part-time student at CIM. So that, you know, that rigorous schedule of still having to do my high school curricular, you know, material, but then also getting the chance to be immersed in that environment of serious college musicians, I think, was really, really eye-opening and very helpful for me to make that transition. Yeah. Can you walk us through um, your academic training journey more in your collegiate days? Yes. So I completed my bachelor's of music at the Juilliard School in New York under Judith LeClaire. And uh, I love Judy. I think that she is an incredible musician, an incredible person. And I think for me, having been so young and having really traveled at that point to go off to a city like New York by myself, was very intimidating. You know, there's so many people, there's so many things going on at one time there. And I found myself missing home a lot and missing that, you know, parental sort of figure in my life. And I found that Judy having a son around my age very much took me under her wing as, you know, a son of hers, a musical son. And I felt like that really sort of propelled me forward and allowed me to feel like I wasn't alone in that space. And after I finished my bachelor's in 2020, during the pandemic, Mm. uh, I then started my professional study certificate at Colburn with Richard Bean. And I did uh, eight months of my PSC degree at Colburn. And then the Forward Symphony audition happened. And then I ended up winning that audition and I left Colburn after one year. It wasn't really an in-person year either. Everything was online. I didn't have private lessons in person. So it was very weird. I think a very weird time, very weird time for everybody during that year, just to be sort of in limbo and not really sure what's going to come next and what's going to happen. So I believe you're the first person we've ever interviewed who has emerged professionally out of the pandemic, or not to right, phrase yeah. the pandemic in past tense, but just uh, who had that period of time be a part of their professional training. I wonder if you could talk to us about that, maybe generally, and then also more specifically, you know, having to prep an audition. I, I wonder how that impacted you know, your musical independence and and guidance and mentorship. Yeah, it's just fascinating. Can you talk about that? 
so I remember I was still auditioning at Colburn when everything started to happen around March of 2020. And I had just gotten into Tangled Music Center for the summer festival. And I was just like planning out what was going to happen. I was at that point planning on going to Colburn to study. And then it originally had started out as just a, an extended spring break. And I was like, great, that's an extra week that I don't have to be at school. And then, you know, as that extended spring break continued, they then announced that the school would be closed for the duration of the school year. And I didn't end up doing a senior recital. So I was pretty bummed about that since the last recital that I had played was my high school senior recital. And I remember right before I left New York, after I'd graduated in August of 2020, I was at Judy's house and we were, I was just playing for her one of the last times I played for her in person before I left. And she just sat me down and she said, Josh, out of this pandemic, I think there are going to be a lot of retirements and I think people are going to end up just, you know, deciding that this is the end of their career. So I think this is a time when there's nothing else going on for you to really focus and really take advantage of this time that you have. Make a lot of reads, practice a lot of excerpts, practice a lot of etudes, and really get yourself in that position so that when something does open up after this, you're ready to be in a job and you're ready to take a spot in an orchestra. And I just remember that really resonated with me because having not played that recital and having sort of that limbo that I had previously discussed happening in this sort of uncertainty, I felt like those words really rang in my ear and they really rang in my heart. And I really took that to heart and I worked really hard during those two years that everything was sort of shut down. And I really put all of my effort into making myself a better musician, a better bassoon player. And then eventually, of course, as she was right, the Fort Worth Symphony audition came up and I was, of course, I was prepared for that because I had used that time wisely and I had used it to better myself as a musician. Okay, so she very wisely replaced the senior recital goal with the win a job goal. Exactly. And, <laughs> and um, it seems like you, t- you took that and ran with it. Um, what did that preparation look like for you? That really long-term preparation of, I'm going to get myself ready for a job. I don't know when that job's coming open. I don't have a date, but it's coming and I'm going to be ready for it. I think just keeping, I think during the pandemic, the biggest thing was just keeping that motivation going. I still today am finding that I'm the kind of person that is able to adequately prepare and prepare, you know, in a very, um, a very um, productive way when, you know, I have a goal that I'm working towards. And of course, at that time, that goal was pretty nebulous because we had no idea what was going to go on. So I think just keeping myself in that read rotation, trying to clip a read a day or two reads a day and just trying to keep my skills that I had learned over the last four years of my undergraduate up during that period of time when nothing was going on. I think that was a big role, played a big role in that preparation for that audition and just continuing to work and know that there will be eventually be something. And I don't want to be in a position in which I didn't use the time that I did have wisely. Yeah. And, and it, also, it's so, oh, go ahead. Sorry, oh, Jay. sorry. I was just going to say, it's so easy to say that, but like, I remember right. when we were in the height of it. This is exactly what I was going to say. Go ahead. You know, I called Galit very upset because I'd been in a Zoom meeting and someone had used the phrase, like, when we get back to normal. And someone said in response, if we ever go back to normal. And I was so freaked out of just like, at that point, we didn't know if orchestras were coming back, if schools were like these things that we'd trained years and years and decades and degrees and degrees for, will they come back? Will they be the same? And I remember the fear almost being paralyzing and the question mark being paralyzing. And so it it's really a testament to your mental and emotional strength that you are able to continue to do the work on faith alone, you know? Yeah, I mean, I just, I was hopeful that we would bounce back, so to speak. But of course, everybody had that doubt that what is normal after this? Like, 
are we going to, you know, be able to come together in a large group of people and not be worried? Are masks going to be a thing of, you know, the rest of our lives? But I think a little part of me still had a hope that we would eventually come back to normal, whatever normal is, of course. Well, I I remember also thinking, you know, during the the really the height of the pandemic, it was first of all super depressing <laughs> for so many reasons, but also like I had I kept having the thought like what does this matter? Who cares about wind playing? Who cares about music when all of this is going on? So you were just so steady and strong during that time. And I would love to hear about like your m- emotional approach to playing. Like what is it a- about music that made you so confident that it was going to come back and it was going to be great. And you had a place in it and it was worth investing in at that time. Of course. So I was in New York at the start of the pandemic. And I just remember I would be practicing and at 5 p.m. every day, people in their apartments would open their windows and get, you know, whatever noisemaker, pots, pans, glasses, cups. And they would like applaud the healthcare workers that were out there on the front lines of the response team for the pandemic. And I just remember just sitting there and just being in awe that like we're all in this together sort of in that time can feel very isolating and that we're alone but in fact everybody in the world is going through this and after the pandemic had been going on for a few weeks I had decided that you know maybe music is what people need so I would go out into the parks in New York and I would just play and I would busk and because I know that the absence of the absence of live performance during that time was you know a big loss for a lot of people And I think that, you know, from all the bad that came out of the pandemic, I think the one good thing is that people sort of had a reality check that music is something that is necessary in our day to day lives. And I think that, you know, it's something that we took for granted before, you know, we get to play weekly concerts in a professional orchestra. But like if that were to stop and the audience and the subscribers to the different symphonies around the country just had no outlet of live music, how that would drastically change their lives. And I think me going out in New York and busking during that time just really gave me that reassurance that people do care about music and people especially care about live music. And I think bringing people that hope that music is not dead just because we're in this situation right now, music is very much alive and well. And it is our job as musicians to, you know, bring people in and show people that this is not over and that regardless of what happens after this, we're going to persevere and come out on top. And you were able to hit the ground running and you obviously made well good use of your time. Uh, so we have many listeners auditioning and very interested in successful audition preparation techniques. And um, I would be interested in hearing your approach um, to, okay, the, the open position is announced. I think I want to go for this. Uh, what did the time leading up to your audition look like? So I found out about the audition from a friend of mine. He sent me the listing about two months before the audition. And I just had a feeling, I was like, I think this is it. I think this is what Judy was talking about. And I went home immediately and I just sat down and I looked at the list. And the first thing that I did was I separated the list into three categories. I have an A list, a B list, and a C list. The A list are excerpts, you know, that I can more or less play right now. I don't really need to like spend a ample amount of time preparing those. B list excerpts are excerpts that I'm familiar with, but of course, just due to the level of skill that they take to execute they're going to need a little bit of time and then c excerpts are excerpts that i'm completely unfamiliar with i've never played i've never heard pieces that i've never you know had the opportunity performing so those are the c list excerpts so i would just categorize my practice and organize it in such a way that i'm adequately preparing all three lists but mainly focusing on the excerpts that i'm unfamiliar with A big part of productive practice is making sure that we're spending time on things that we're not good at rather than things that we are. 
is of course it's good to you know get that affirmation that hey I can pull this excerpt out and I can play it well but that's not always the most productive use of our time so I think really focusing on what you're not good at is a big part of you know audition preparation and just adequately setting yourself up with reads of course we don't need 10 incredible reads for an audition we just need one but just having different options of reads that play at a high level good pieces of cane that work I think is another huge part of audition preparation. And, you know, it's something that we have to spend a lot of time on. It's double read players. It's making sure that we have the read because without the read, of course, nothing is going to work. When you say that the excerpt is good, what do you mean? To me, playing an excerpt well is, um, I think going back a little bit, I think, and the interesting thing about music is that music is subjective. However, there are objective qualities of music, objective qualities such as rhythm, uh, intonation, and things like that. So I really, when I'm thinking about playing an excerpt well, I'm thinking about how is my rhythm? Is my rhythm consistent? Am I slowing down? Am I speeding up? Is my intonation, am I generally sharp? Am I flat? Am I generally in tune? And just trying to get those objective things down extremely well, because of course, everything else, phrasing, people can argue one way or another, sound quality, people can argue one way or another, but those objective things have to be there in order for you to succeed and do well in an audition setting. Um, in terms of your preparation, about how much um, time do you spend like recording yourself or doing mock auditions or like, do you have like a set system for that kind of thing? Yes. So I record myself very often and I think it's important to record very often throughout the process because as musicians, we're so used to hearing ourselves behind the instrument rather than what people in front of the instrument are hearing. And I think that's another way for us to be objective with ourselves about how well we're actually playing something. It's sort of like a reality check that we can do often with ourselves is hearing what other people are hearing. So dynamics, for example, we may think that we're playing super quiet, but then you listen to a recording and it's actually not as quiet as you think it is. So I think just putting like the level of the excerpts into perspective is where recording yourself often comes in. And I think that that's a really valuable tool that we have as musicians at our disposal is being able to record ourselves and listen back. Um, and I just think that that recording is so telling more than I think us hearing ourselves play live is. So record yourself often is the point. <laughs> <laughs> Can we hear about that day? What was the process of winning your position? Uh, so I won the audition in May of 2021, and I got into Texas around the first of the month. I believe the audition was the third and fourth. And I was staying with a friend at the time up in one of the suburbs of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And... I remember that I got downtown in Fort Worth right before the audition. The auditions were not happening at the concert hall, just due to the COVID restrictions at the time still. They were happening at one of the hotels that are in the downtown area. Wow. And I just remember walking in and I checked in for the audition. And it was a very strange audition because it was, the, I believe, the first audition that happened out of the pandemic. So people weren't really sure what was going to happen, what to expect, you know, group warm-up rooms before you go on to be in your personal warm-up room before you go into the room for the audition. You know, is that going to be something that we're going to have here because of, you know, the COVID restrictions? Like, what is the deal with masks? Are people going to be, like, you know, worried about us being masked? In certain points so it was just a lot of unknown factors right so I just went in and I just played and I warmed up in my room and then I went into each round and I think what was interesting about Fort Worth is that I get extremely nervous before an audition or a performance that is you know high stakes and I just remember right before going into the audition room there was this sort of calmness that came over me right before 
Like I was incredibly nervous in my personal warm up room and standing outside of the room before I went in. But right before I walked in, there was like this calmness that came over me and it was very unusual. I'd taken a couple of auditions before Fort Worth, but that was never really a thing that had happened. So that calmness and that calm sensation that came over me that sort of relieved the nervousness was very new to me. And I still to this day have no idea what it was. Maybe it was just the amount of preparation that I put in that I knew that I put in all that I could. And if I'm what they're looking for, then that's great. But if I'm not, at least I know that I put in the time and I put in the work that was necessary to do well and set myself up in a positive way. What was it like when they announced that you were the winner? I was really nervous. Uh, I was walking and pacing around the hotel. It was me and uh, one other bassoon player. And I was just pacing around because it was taking a while. And of course, in a moment like that, of course, it feels like it takes an eternity. So I'm walking to and from the bathroom and I'm walking around the warm up room that they had us in. And I walked to the bathroom one last time and I ran into the personnel manager and she was like, Josh, we've been looking for you. Follow me. (laughs) So I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, this is the moment. Am I, is this for me or is this not for me? And I remember walking into the room and the committee is sitting in their formation. And the time at this time, Robert Spano had just been announced as the music director. So he was in charge of hiring all the new hires for that season and, you know, moving forward. And at first he was looking down and he was writing on a piece of paper And I just remember thinking, oh, God, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And then he just looked up at me and he's like, oh, we would just like to offer you a job. And then, of course, everybody stood to their feet and clapped. And, you know, it was just such a surreal moment because I think as musicians, we look forward to making it, whatever that means for different people's lives and career choices. Some people, you know, that's landing a huge teaching position at a university or conservatory other people that's you know landing their first record label or album that they're part of and for other people it's winning an orchestral job and for me specifically it was winning an orchestral job so having that surreal moment of I made it whatever that means was really powerful and it really meant a lot and I just think I was just on cloud nine for weeks days weeks months after just thinking that you know all that hard work that I put in during the pandemic and before, since I've been playing my instrument, had finally paid off in a positive way. Um, and now it's been two full, you're probably finishing up your second full season? I my second season, yes. So what have you learned since being in this position? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess what have you learned generally and, and what do you think makes a great principal bassoonist? I think a great principal bassoonist is a great person. First and foremost, of course, if you're in the job, you can play the instrument at a competent level. But I think part of being a leader in the orchestra is being a good person and somebody that people can depend on, rely on musically, and somebody that people enjoy being around. I think that's a huge thing in an orchestra is being a good colleague. And, you know, in school, you learn, of course, how to be in, how to win an orchestra audition. But I think a topic that should be discussed more is how can we be good colleagues to each other? And I think that that's just as important. Judy always told me uh, going through school is that, you know, the easy part is winning the job. The hard part is keeping the job. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is incredibly true. Once you're in the job, you have to go through the tenure period in which you're not tenured yet and you're attempting to earn tenure. And your rapport with your colleagues and the music director and your other musicians around the orchestra is very important, especially in that time period. So I think just coming into work, being grateful that you have that job and have somewhere that you can call your musical home and you get to share these incredible pieces by these incredible composers with these incredible people. I think just having gratitude always about where you are and the opportunities that you have currently in your life. So I think practicing gratitude is very important, being a good colleague, and of course, showing up prepared and knowing your part. Rehearsal is for, you know, everybody to get together and fit it together. It's not necessarily for you to sit down and learn the part that you didn't have enough time to practice prior to the rehearsal. 
Has your read making changed at all being in the job than uh, preparing for the audition? Yes. Uh, my read style and the way I approach the instrument is very different now. I find that, you know, one of the things that I struggled with in school was dynamic contrast. I've always thought the bassoon was a beautiful instrument. I always wanted to make it sound beautiful. So I would shy away from the louder dynamics in an attempt to, you know, keep the sound beautiful always. And I would try not to get too soft because also I wanted to keep the sound beautiful. So my dynamic range is quite small. And you get into a job on a professional orchestra and it's like completely the opposite. You need really loud, loud and really soft, soft. So that dynamic contrast, I think, was one of the biggest things that has changed in my read making and in my bassoon playing since I've started in the Forward Symphony. And I think now I just have to make a lot more reads of higher quality, just because, you know, in school, you may have an orchestra cycle a month or even less frequently than that, whereas here I'm playing week after week for the entire year and I have to be on my A game all the time. So having that quality control of the product that we have to create in order to make sound, I think is very important. So keeping that regimen of making reads all the time is incredibly important. You referenced earlier when you were talking about winning your current position with the Fort Worth Symphony, that you are someone who experiences nerves. Uh, can you talk to us about, you know, now you're in this position and you have expectations and you're performing professionally regularly. Um, how has your approach to uh, performance anxiety um, changed or what methods do you use to deal with this part of the reality of what we do? I think I realize that nerves come from insecurity about something so for performance it could be maybe you didn't have as much time as you would have liked to prepare for something and I find myself to be more nervous if I haven't spent the adequate amount of time so I think just you know making sure that my preparation is adequate and productive has helped a lot with the nerves and of course you know breathing techniques reassuring yourself that you can in fact do it I think our self-dialogue is very important as well, making sure that we're reassuring ourselves. And of course, being realistic at the same time, we don't always have the amount of time that we would like to prepare for something. So using the time that you are given in a productive way and having a very positive self-dialogue is very important and nerves and trying to combat that naturally. Of course, there's different tools like beta blockers, and people do different, you know, yoga, Pilates, different things that help to one to become more in tune with their body and their mind. I think those are useful tools as well. But for me, it's having that positive self-dialogue before performance or an audition or anything like that. That really plays a huge part in how nervous I get. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of creating a safe space in your own mind. Yes. And being realistic, like, okay, realistically, this is what could happen based off of my preparation and the time that I had. And I'm going to be okay with that, no matter yeah. what that is. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Would you share with us, um, it's usually we do this question a little bit later in the interview, but I'm so curious to hear about, you know, maybe a recent favorite concert that you've played. Have you had any very special experiences uh, in the orchestra since your appointment? Yes. Yeah, so uh, last summer is actually around a year ago. We uh, The Forward Symphony is the orchestra for the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition. And uh, no big deal. Of course, no big deal. <laughs> but it happens every four years. And just the level of or the amount of music that we have to prepare for that, you get a list of around like 30 to 40 piano concerti. And you never know which one could be chosen. You have like the list of all the candidates and what they're playing, but you don't know who's going to advance to the next round. So the night before the first rehearsal, you get the music that you're actually going to be playing because they've announced who's moving on to the next round. And the first round that the orchestra plays is the semifinal round, which is Mozart Piano Concerti. 
And as bassoon players, that is, you know, meat and potatoes of piano repertoire. That's where all of the incredible bassoon writing is. So to come in and have maybe 12 hours notice about which of these Mozart piano concerti we're going to be playing um, was in- insane, honestly. And then the final round was uh, two concertos from... Uh, you know, one of them was like Beethoven, the Gershwin, Ravel Piano Concerto for the left hand, the Concerto in G major, um, and the Rachmaninoff Piano Concerti, the Prokofiev Piano Concerti. And I think one of the highlight performances so far I've had here was with Yun Chen Lim, the 2021, 2022 Clyburn Piano Competition winner for last year, his Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto, being able to be there in the room when that was being played and be able to play in the orchestra for that performance was incredible. He's an incredible musician and getting that opportunity to share the stage and create beautiful music with him is definitely one of my highlights so far being here. That's so cool. I, I I wondered if Ravel and G, like, I wouldn't want that to take me by surprise, but I guess you just have to be ready for you it. Have to, be ready, have to be ready. Anything can happen. <laughs> Anything can happen. <laughs> um, can we hear about the instrument that you play and how it came into your life? Yes. Yeah, so I play a 7000 series heckle. And the instrument came to my life in a very interesting way. So I was in high school, and in high school, I was playing on the school's Fox 240. And it was a great instrument. It served its purpose. But I was graduating, and I didn't have my own instrument, and I needed to get one. And I had an orchestra director from the high school. In my high school, the orchestra and the band were separate. So there was never a full symphony. It was like two separate programs. But of course, I was, you know, familiar with the orchestra director. And her husband was a freelance bassoonist in the Cleveland area. He's principal in the Akron Symphony, Todd Jellin. And I remember during marching band camp, my senior year, she came up to me and she was like, you know, my husband is selling his bassoon. Are you interested in trying it and maybe buying it? And of course, had I having an instrument, hearing the word heckle, I was like, absolutely. So I tried it out at the beginning of my senior year, and I loved it instantly. You know, coming from a fox to a heckle, I think especially a pre-war heckle is a very interesting uh, transition, just because the fox, you know, sort of plays itself in a lot of ways. You don't have to really work to make it play at a high level but a heckle you sort of have to learn the nuance of each instrument each instrument is completely different so you know just getting familiar with the instrument in that time period I you know fell in love instantly and I just remember going back to her and I was like I would love to buy this instrument but right now like financially this this is insane like this is a lot of money for a 12th grader in high school to pay for And eventually, at the end of my senior year, I was able to come up with the funds to help pay for the instrument. And from then, that has been my instrument. And I love it. It's an incredible bassoon. Since we're talking about equipment, can you um, share with us some uh, reed specs? What's your preferred setup for your reeds? Yes. So I play on the Hertzberg shape. I've always been a fan. When I was in LA for the year that I was at Colburn, I was experimenting with some reed shapes. I tried Rieger 1A, I tried Fox 2, I tried Nockenhauer. But there was just something about the Hertzberg and just like the simplicity of the shape that really just kept me coming back. Like I was always looking for something that was maybe a little wider, a little bigger, but I always came back to Hertzberg and I've been playing on Hertzberg uh, basically since I was an undergrad, uh, Judy plays on Hertzberg, Richard Bean plays on Hertzberg. So just that constant Hertzberg, uh, trajectory that I've been on since I basically started studying bassoon seriously, uh, has just kept me in the game, so to speak, with the shape and that read style. Where do you look to for motivation how do you feed your soul when maybe work feels like work and you get a little depleted 
Yeah, I always lean on close friends of mine, other bassoon players. I think one of my idols is Andrew Brady. He is an absolutely incredible bassoon player and an incredible person. And I think hearing him play and, you know, just reminding myself why I do music, I think that is so important, especially when we start feeling a lack of motivation. Or, as you said, work starts to feel like work. It's just finding and digging deep as to why we went into it in the first place. I think that's what keeps us going as musicians and why people have such long careers is that, you know, thought in the back of your head all the time about why you got into it in the first place. So I think just reminding myself that there are great musicians everywhere. And I think for me, Andrew is a big inspiration to become a better musician. And I think listening to him play reminds me why I wanted to play the bassoon in the first place. Of course, other great people, Whitney Crockett, uh, Judy, of course, uh, Barry Spees, John Clauser. The list goes on and on. There's a, a plethora of incredible bassoon players at our disposal to listen to and learn from. But I just find myself always, whenever I'm feeling a lack of motivation, is trying to, you know, practice gratitude and practice and think about why I got into music in the first place and keep reminding myself of that. You bringing up an admiration for Andrew reminded me that I wanted to be sure to ask about your experience at the Gateways Music Festival. And can you tell us about that experience and what makes that orchestra special? Yes. uh, The Gateways Music Festival was an incredible experience. Uh, Last April, we did our first Carnegie Hall performance. And if I'm not mistaken, it was the first all African American orchestra to ever play at Carnegie Hall. And I think that in and of itself just made it super special. And being able to share the stage with people that look like me, I think part of being an African American in classical music is that I don't see a lot of myself being portrayed back Of course, you know, there's people that I've always looked up to, Andrew, Anthony McGill, who have, you know, been sort of pinnacles in my musical journey so far, and people that look like me that I can look up to for advice, support, Mm -hmm. and, you know, getting the opportunity to share the stage with people that look like me was just incredible. And I think that having that opportunity and being able to, you know, be there for such a momentous occasion was really just a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, Another uh, festival that's similar to that, that I've had the honor of partaking in is the Chinake Orchestra in Mm -hmm. London. That was also an incredible uh, experience. And that performance that we gave at the BBC proms last August of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was also one of the highlights of my career thus far, being able to share the stage with colleagues of mine that look like me in, you know, England was also just a breathtaking and momentous occasion that I wouldn't change anything for the world for it. Okay, so we just talked about uh, some really beautiful memories, but is there anything maybe funny or embarrassing that has ever happened to you in a performance that you would care to share with us to make us feel better about ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> so actually this story is from a long time ago. It was actually in sixth grade, ironically, when I first started the bassoon. Um, I went home after school and we had a band concert that evening And at that point, I didn't really have a real reed case. And as most bassoonists, I'm sure, have experienced, I put my reeds into an Altoid case with holes drilled in it. (laughs) And I remember I let, I took them out of the case because I was going to warm up a little before the concert. And I left them at home. And I drove all the way to the high school, which is about 20, 25 minutes from my house. And I got there about 30 minutes before the concert started. And the first, you know, band on the concert was in the jazz, was the jazz band. And at that time, me and another bassoon player in the band were both in the jazz band as bassoon players. And I remember I got to the band room, I'm opening my case and I'm looking through every compartment. I'm like, oh my goodness, where are my reeds? And I'm like freaking out. Thank God my family was there. So I ran over to my mom and I was like, you need to run home and get my reeds. Like, this is 
serious. Like, this is insane. Like, I don't understand how I forgot these. <laughs> so she runs back. I'm going to the band director and I'm explaining to him. I'm like, I forgot my reads at home, but my mom just ran home to get them. I'll have them soon. Of course, she'll be here traffic. in 60 minutes. <laughs> I, and of course, there's traffic. So, like, she gets caught in traffic on the way there and I think on the way back to. And it was just a disaster. It's 7 30, the concert started. My band director's like, well, you can just sit on stage and, like, you know, maybe your colleague has another read that you can use. No, she didn't. You know, in sixth grade, we have maybe one read. And then when maybe that read, uh, <laughs> like, get another one. So, like, she didn't have anything for me. So I'm sitting on stage and they left the auditorium doors open. So I'm looking through the auditorium doors while the band is playing and I'm like trying to see my mom comes. And I finally see her pull up to the school and she walks to the door. In the middle of the piece, I get up from my chair and I run through the audience to go get my bassoon reads. I grab the reads, I run back on stage. And I put the read on and I like play as if nothing had ever happened. And my band director was so upset with me. He's like, don't run off stage during a concert. You don't do that. That's not good etiquette. If you want to do this professionally, that's not acceptable. You should have just stayed where you were until the piece was finished. But of course, being a little ignorant integrator, I had no idea what I was supposed to do in that scenario. I saw I was trying to be the hero and like do what I was supposed to do from the get go, but it didn't end well for me. But I think that is probably the most embarrassing thing that's happened. <laughs> during my career as a bassoonist. <laughs> that is amazing. That is- <laughs> I, I, okay. I, ran, I don't think I've ever ran so fast. I was attempting to make it a quick exchange, grab the reach, run back on stage, and act like I just never left. But of course, the band director noticed and was very upset by that. <laughs> I feel like your mom's the hero of this podcast. Yeah. Oh, she absolutely <laughs> is. She absolutely is. <laughs> I feel like that whole year, your mom never stopped rolling her eyes at you. I know. She was over me. From sixth grade, <laughs> from sixth grade, she was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> but, you know, she's happy now that I've finally, you know, got a job playing the bassoon, and I'm in my job, and I'm not playing the violin anymore, or the clarinet, or anything. <laughs> so it's just like, I've honed my focus in. <laughs> She told me when I switched from, I think it was when I switched from clarinet to the bassoon, she said, Jack of all trades, master of none. Oh! <laughs> like, that's what she had said. Oh! I don't quite know what that means. Of course I do now, but in the time, I really didn't know what that meant. And I just remember saying, you know, I'm going to show you, like, I can do this. I'm not going to be jack of all trades. I just want to play this one thing. I've already given piano up. I've given the violin up. I'm not going to go back to clarinet. Like, this is it. And I think that I've proven that to her that the bassoon was it and that I wasn't going to go anywhere else. <laughs> yes, you should like release an album and call it Master of One. Oh, yeah, that is a oh. great idea. That is a great idea. <laughs> it's a little vengeful, but. <laughs> <laughs> album, that's a good idea. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> what advice? do you have for a young musician listening who aspires to have a career like yours? Listen to music. I don't think that that can be stressed enough. I think listening to quality, good music by good musicians, I think is really important. It helps to develop your musical voice. It helps to develop your sound concept just because you're hearing and taking a lot of great musical ideas I think listening is the root to all things great that come from playing an instrument. I think just being open and not just bassoon music, all types of music, jazz, uh, string quartets, choral music, chamber orchestra, brass quintet, woodwind quintet, just like the list goes on and on. Any good music that you can consume is great for your development as a musician and as a bassoon player. Joshua, this has been such a wonderful hour talking with you. We are so grateful for you to um, spend time with us on our podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay.
follow us on social media. Um, let us know if you want us to do a live podcast event sometime this summer. We need to write that down. I'll forget about it the second we're done mm-hmm. recording. Mm-hmm. And also start watching Sister Wives season one, episode one. Come on. Okay. Oh, yeah. R- rate and review. Rate and review. Who's on the next episode? Galit. <laughs> We had the pleasure of talking with Jeffrey Burgess, instructor of Baroque Oboe at the Eastman School of Music and Oboe Editor of The Double Read. Jackie, we got to end this nerd parade. Oh, I agree. <laughs>